is one semester at your local junior college, maybe a hundred, two hundred dollars, and you'll know more about emergency medical matters than 99 percent of the people in this country. One semester at your local junior college. You don't need to worry about passing a test unless you intend to be a paramedic or an EMT. You don't need to worry about taking a test at all. You want to learn the skills and you want to get a kit equal to your skill level. Now the paramedic training is three more, three more semesters of college on top of that first one. And then you'll have a skill level almost equal to a medical doctor when it comes to emergency medical treatment. The skills of a ham radio operator. Now, I've been in places, I've been in combat, and I know what it's like not to know what's going on. This book that I offer on my website, Emergency Survival Communications, excellent book. It's written for people who don't know anything about radios. Sitting someplace when things are bad, let's take an example most of us are familiar with, 9-11-01. By mid-morning of the 11th day of September 2001, I knew we were at war because smoke was coming up out of the Pentagon. That's how I knew we were at war. I set up emergency communications on my dining room table. I monitored the local emergency frequencies where I lived in St. Louis. I monitored the radio frequencies nationally and I monitored the TV stations for 24 hours a day, seven days a week for, uh, for about 10 days or so. We finally shut it down. Being able to instantly and effectively communicate with your friends and loved ones we found this out during Hurricane Katrina. Two-way radio communication that you control could mean the difference between life and death. In Hurricane Katrina, it was a matter of life and death for many people. The ability to communicate with their loved ones, let them know they were okay, ask for help, or be able to give help. The skills of a backpacker, being able to carry everything you need on your back, your shelter, your clothing, your hygiene needs, being able to clean yourself out in the field, prepare food out in the field, and do so in a manner that doesn't make you sick. Being able to take water out of a stream and filter it so you can drink it without getting sick. All the things that a backpacker knows, the skills of a soldier. In a severe crisis like Hurricane Katrina, for example, you're your own cop, you're your own soldier, or nobody's protected. That's what it comes down to. You become your own soldier, you become your own police officer, and you protect your loved ones because of these skills that you learn. Animal husbandry. In a severe long-term crisis, having goats and sheep and chickens and ducks and rabbits can mean the difference between a fairly good and healthy diet and one that's terribly lacking in protein. It's extremely difficult to get the protein you need from an all-vegetable diet. Extremely difficult. The skills of a carpenter, of an electrician, of a plumber. Things that we may call up a professional to do now, you, you will be on your own to make these repairs. The skills of an automobile mechanic. All these skills take years to learn, and you can't learn them out of a book, at least not and be very effective. There's some things you can learn out of a book, but without practical application, you're just guessing at how this stuff works. Where do you live? I've had a number of questions during our breaks about where safe areas are. The Arkansas, Missouri, and Ozarks are one of the known safe havens. That's basically the bottom third of Missouri, not counting the boot heel, and the top third of Arkansas, not counting north, northeast Arkansas, that flat area where they grow rice. It's not considered part of the Ozarks. It has Altitude, it's well above sea level, averaging 800 to 1,000 feet above sea level, some places a little lower, some places a little higher. A moderate winter, at least for the time being. I hope that continues. Good growing season as a consequence of that. Plenty of water, no shortage of water at all. And distance between where you will be and major metropolitan areas. 
The two largest metropolitan areas being Chicago, excuse me, being St. Louis and Kansas City. A friend of mine, one of the submarine veterans, lives in Mountain Home, Arkansas, very near the Missouri border. He says, John, we have all these people from Chicago moving down here. <laughs> all these Chicago cops. <laughs> Maybe they know something, huh? If you're choosing a place to live and thrive during a severe long-term crisis in the Ozarks, you may think, well, myself and my spouse, we can do this. Then I remind people who, th who are considering that of the number 168. 168 hours in a week, and in a severe long-term crisis, somebody's going to have to be awake 168 hours a week. Because no, t no people can do that, I suggest that at least six adults uh, come together and decide to shelter as a group. I also su suggest that people have at least a two-year supply of food. Professor McCanny, in one of his books, his 60-page pamphlet about surviving Planet X, he mentions the need, the possible future need, to establish a new calendar. It goes something like this. If there would be a, a pole shift, it would change the seasons, it would change the calendar. In fact, within recorded history, the calendar has changed from 360 days to 365 days. That's, this has happened in the past. If it changes more than three or four weeks, though, Here's what could happen. You could plant your seeds at the wrong time. If you plant your seeds at the wrong time and you can't go to the grocery store to get food, this could be a life-threatening situation. So you need to be able to know when the time to plant is so you don't plant at the incorrect time and end up losing all those valuable seeds. That brings to mind another matter that's, that's in plain sight, the, the seed banks that are being built. There's some uh, notoriety earlier this year in 2008 about the seed bank opening up in Norway. As close to the Arctic Circle as you can get and still have what might be considered normal human activity built into the side of a mountain. A seed bank where they can store all the seeds from all the plants on the planet, apparently. So they're hiding that in plain sight. Now I need to go back to Dr. Velikowski's quote here. Dr. Velikowski was a medical doctor and he wrote uh, several books about these matters and he was hammered on mercilessly. One of the things Dr. Velikowski did was reconcile calendars, like when you reconcile your checkbook. And it's the nature of professionals in, in, all, in all professions not to talk to people who don't do what they do. You know, lawyers typically don't talk to, talk to doctors and archaeologists who study Egypt don't st talk to archaeologists who, talk to, who study China. And nobody had ever done this previously. And it's not easy to do, reconcile calendars from these ancient cultures. Dr. Velikowski made an observation. There is a passage in the Bible the Israelis are having this battle, and they need a few extra hours to win this battle. And guess what? They got a few extra. Their day was a few hours longer. You know the quote, Jim. Yeah, I don't know the quote, but I know it, the incident. Right. Now, typically when we study the Bible, if there's something we can't understand, we just say, well, God's just trying to make a point. You know, this really didn't happen. That's what we do. Up until fairly recently, that's what we had to do with the incident with the Israelis fighting this battle. Well, God was trying to make a point that he had the power to do this. It really didn't happen. Well, it turns out we now know scientifically how that could happen, and the only way it could happen. For the Israelis to get three or four hours more daylight, the only way that can happen is for the planet to roll over in space, giving those extra four hours. Here's what Velikowski said. Well, if the sun didn't set over the Sinai Desert when it was supposed to, on that date, and he had the date because the Israelis had calendars and they wrote it down, that's a pretty